Hi, and welcome everyone. We are inside of Mayor Fecunditatis. It's where we left off in the last video. Thanks to all new subscribers. We're trying, as a goal, the community here, to get to 100,000 people that know this truth. Of all my findings and all who appreciate it, we're trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. This year, 2021 is the year. And Demian Creator, a whole bunch of creators have been showing over the years. Mare Fecunditatis, what is that over to the right? Why is today the creator higher than it is, more elevated with that white billowing smoke around it? On the left, we see overlapping um, lines. We're going to have to get in really close. And for those that will appreciate it, which I know many of you will, um, it's hard to see. Let's start off like this. Already we're having problems to get in. So we can't get in much more, but we see a bend at the end there. Ooh, now we're seeing another object. And look at that black line again, always beside the light. It's a pattern that appears very often on the surface of the moon. We're inside Merfecunditatis. We're looking at um, anomalies that absolutely look like roads or construct con constructed objects sorry this is live let's look at it live and again we're really pressed up close pretty much into the maximum that we can before distortion starts because there's no distortion here but we do see um, some movement and um, lights even at the beginning of some movement on the surface we would have to get in a lot closer to be able to actually see if there was traffic for example i'm serious but we'll know that with a bigger telescope and um, I doubt that in June they're going to talk about that. Pentagon has 180 days, don't forget. Those of you who don't know, they have to talk um, about UFOs. The world is supposedly uh, waiting for um, UFO disclosure in June, hopefully. Oh yeah, I'll be speaking up a lot this year, explaining in great detail exactly everything that I've been showing. Let me show you something really interesting that maybe only researchers, maybe only NASA or ufology associations are going to understand. I'm going to explain to you what a professional will say when he sees these structures, the way they're presented and the angles they have. Parallax, that's what we're going to talk about. A displacement or difference in the apparent position of an object viewed along two different lines of sight. And that's what we're doing. Viewing the moon from Earth is going to give us bent objects and distort the image for us. It's measured by the angle or semi-angle of inclination between two lines. So this is due to something I mention often, foreshortening. Nearby objects show a larger parallax than farther objects when observed from different positions. So parallax can be used to determine distances. Parallax also affects optical instruments such as rifle scopes, binoculars, microscopes, and twin lens reflect cameras that view objects from slightly different angles. Many animals along with humans have uh, two eyes with overlapping visual fields. That uses parallax to gain depth perception. This process is known as stereopsis. We've heard of that sometimes. I think I've mentioned it vaguely here on the channel. So a simple everyday example of parallax can be seen um, when you're sitting in a car with someone, you're in the passenger seat, you're looking at a speedometer with a needle, not digital, that says 60 kilometers an hour, and you see uh, 58 or 59 kilometers an hour, and me, the driver, sitting in front of that needle will see the 60 or 61 kilometers. So the passenger is experiencing parallax, visual parallax, and is seeing a difference. Um, you know, he's still seeing the needle. He's still seeing it uh, almost 99% um, as to where it, um, to what the image is, but the image is a bit out of place. And that is parallax. So often I'll get a, um, from a troll or from just somebody that doesn't understand a question on why do I see clearer than them or wider? How am I magnifying it? Look here. Look at the triangle on top and look at it on the bottom. 
all we are seeing right here are two different viewpoints, two different perspectives of a depth of an image inside a deep field perspective and um, in a line, right? So when the moon is in line with you, you will see um, the structures less distorted. When it's offset with you, well, that's the difference that you will we'll see. Like I told you about the 60 kilometers an hour, the passenger sitting in the passenger seat is going to see a bit of a difference in the angle of the image, but the image itself is going to be the same. Here, look at the way the uh, perfect explanation, and you will understand when you leave here what parallax is. Do you see how some of these um, objects, structures, natural or not, look offset to one another or crooked, sort of like out of an angle? Well, that is the effect, visual effect, digital visual effect of a parallax. And that's why some of these objects could be a lot higher than what we are seeing. But the rectangle I'm showing you is a rectangle. It's not a circle. It's a definite rectangle. Look at this image, how the top box right there, this one, looks like it's elevated and sinking into the ground. It could be just an effect of the parallax. So we're talking about reasons why we see the moon moving or turning or why the objects are laying down, like this one that some say that is a tower. Let's go see a little bit about libration. Libration is the wagging of the moon perceived by us here, the observers on Earth. Uh, changes in our perspectives, they say that we see. What's libration, guys? You know how the beautiful moon is always wobbling, changing and shifting and tilting? Well, it's not only rotating and tilting. Listen up, there are different types of libration and different ways to calculate libration, which is very interesting. And also, um, it permits us as an observer to see slightly different halves of the surface at different times, even the dark side. It's similar in both cause and effect to the changes of the moon's apparent size due to the changes, also guys, in the distance. So as you can see, the moon is rocking and rolling. It's going away. It's coming uh, to and forth, to and from, to and from. Um, so it's caused by three mechanisms, they say. This is the explanation, the astronomical explanation. I'm talking about, uh, first of all, causing a relatively tiny physical libration, they say, via tidal forces. And then we'll talk about lunar libration. But before that, you know, the tidal forces, an apparent force that stretches a body towards and away from the center of mass of another body due to a gradient difference in strength. So they each have a different gravitational field and strength, both the moon and earth from the other body. So this is what's happening. It's responsible for diverse phenomena, they also say, including here, the tides, tidal locking, uh, and get this, breaking apart of celestial bodies and formation of ring systems. So because of earth, we could pull in a whole star system and the stars will come down towards Earth just by the pull and gravity. Um, you know, black holes and stars, they're just finding this out that uh, the tidal forces of them and gravitational forces of them can attract entire systems and even galaxies to collide together. So now we're going to go back and talk about the lunar libration, another type of libration. So the moon keeps one hemisphere of itself facing the Earth due to the tidal locking, they say. But the libration in longitude results from the um, eccentricity of the moon's orbit around Earth. The moon's rotation sometimes leads and sometimes lags its orbital position. And that's awesome, meaning the moon is sometimes faster than the Earth as it's locked in place due to tidal waves and it's still doing its rotation, and sometimes it's gaining speed, and at times it's losing speed. Again, going further and getting closer, um, you can see the top. So, to see literally the dark side, or a part of it, the minute, the, see the Terminator line as it's getting dark, the front top part is coming this way, and look, there, you start taking photos, you start getting live shots, and you're seeing a very, uh, hidden part of the moon that we don't see. Like right now, it's already hidden as it's rolling back. Right. Now that that information is fresh in our minds, let's go over and talk a little bit about the satellites and 
about what is supposed to happen with the sun from now, by the way, all the way up to 2025. And we'll also talk a little bit about CMEs, see some of my own examples of the CMEs that I've captured off of the sun, literally plasma leaving the sun. So those satellites are out there, not only for cable, I believe they're definitely out there to detect something that could come into the atmosphere of uh, to, into the solar system, actually, then, yes, eventually into Earth's atmosphere and maybe even into lower Earth orbit. These objects um, and the sun itself, um, when I film it, you see the arrow on the left is that regular line I usually always see. I don't see the second line ever around it with the filter I have. And then I started seeing it bulging out to one side. Of course, not having any experience in filming a CME, I had no idea why the sun was doing that because I'd only filmed the sun about 40, 50 times um, in a period of maybe a, a couple of years, two, three years, maybe three, four years. Here is the CME on October 26, 2017 that I captured coming out of the sun. If you go and look and there's no CMEs those days, well, it could be, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to lie, it was October 26th, 2017. If NASA mentioned it, and I think they did, they always mention it a couple of days after. It's most often what happens. They don't necessarily even tell the exact date of the occurrence of it. Most often things are hidden. But that large object coming out of the sun is um, far bigger than Earth. And that is the danger of what they say those geometrical storms that can come send a lot of energy and these coronal mass ejections are not really really understood so basically a coronal mass ejection a cme sometimes um, coincide with solar flares there are huge explosions of matter gas and magnetized plasma that rocket away from the sun at millions of miles per hour. Because just looking at this footage says nothing. But understanding what you're looking at looks small. It's in the screen. It's not small. It's very huge. It's about as wide as the sun. This line of um, magnetized plasma rocketing towards Earth. Now, here are the dangers. What are the problems? Solar flares and CMEs pose no direct threat to humans. Well, so to say, Earth's atmosphere protects us from the radiation of space weather. If an astronaut out in space, not to linger on it, was bombarded with high energy particles from a CME, well, he's a, you know seriously injured or he's a goner. He or she is a goner for sure. Um, when a CME hits Earth's magnetosphere, the volume of space around our planet influenced by our magnetic field, get this, if it is directed southward, it will strongly interact with Earth's northward-oriented magnetic field. When this happens, Earth's magnetic field is peeled back, guys, just like an onion. And it allows energetic solar wind particles to stream down the field lines to hit the atmosphere over the poles. So this is why I often mention the North Pole and the South Pole, the dangers of entry. Uh, from those geomagnetic storms or CMEs. The geomagnetic storm that results from coronal mass ejections, magnetosphere interactions can muck up all kinds of technology that we rely upon. Modern life satellites that or orbit high up in the geosynchronous orbits, of course, and many of them communication satellites, everything. They're all vu vulnerable to these geomagnetic storms either because they could be uh, penetrated by high energy particles or because the satellites could become highly charged. Now, that is where the CMEs get dangerous for us, causing key components to be damaged by discharging currents, which could be dangerous for us. And I'm not talking about the satellites, but for us. Even more serious is the potential for CMEs to damage electrical grids. A geomagnetic storm produces electrical currents in conductive material on the ground, including through pipelines, funny they closed it, communication cables, funny they turned off Texas, and power lines. Hmm. These large geomagnetically induced currents can overload transformers and lead to widespread blackouts. Infrared cameras. 
very rare capturing here in the skies of Montreal, Quebec, more than you could ever imagine. You all have to come to Montreal if you're ufologists or if you're UFO um, enthusiasts. The skies were filled with them here. And now, once again, the activity is starting back up. Look at this directional change. Only a couple of months ago um, that I captured and always something cool. I have a lot of videos, actually check them out, that I'm actually literally speaking and asking them to move around in the sky for me, doing some tests, and with luck. Luis Carlos Arajo da Costa. Gracias, muchas gracias, mi amigo. Thank you very much for the generous contribution. Bobby Catanese, thank you so much. Cause the slow just coming soon. The slow just coming soon. 